Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady. And for today's conversation with Matt Scott, we talk about our upcoming expedition across Africa. We have been planning this trip for close to four years now, and we are finally getting ready to leave. In fact, I leave tomorrow morning to fly into Johannesburg, and the INEOS Grenadier is going to arrive a few days later at the port in Durban. So we've selected the INEOS Grenadier to cross the continent of Africa. So please enjoy my conversation with Matt Scott about our upcoming Trans-Africa Expedition. And a special thanks to Rocky Talkies for their support of this week's podcast. Rocky Talkies are backcountry radios designed by a small team in Denver. The radios are extremely rugged, easy to use, and compact, weighing in at just under eight ounces. They have a range of one to five miles in the mountains and up to 25 miles line of sight. The batteries will last from three to five days, and you can recharge them easily via USB-C right in the vehicle. Our team uses Rocky Talkies, and we also used them recently at the Overland Expo. The next Overland Expo, stop into our booth and say hello and check out the radios for yourself. And as a listener of the Overland Journal podcast, you can get 10% off a pair by going to rockytalkie.com forward slash Overland Journal. Thanks again, Rocky Talkie. All right, Matt. We're talking travel. We get to talk about travel. We get to talk about us traveling, which is exciting. So... We're getting ready to leave for Africa. So this is a trip that I've been planning for four years and I've been so excited to go, but I was just looking for the right combination of timing and, and opportunity. And there's been little hints dropped here and there. There the has podcast. been. That's right. Exactly. And my plan originally was just to take a motorcycle and just go do it. And then this new car company, Ineos, comes into the, into the scene and I'm thinking, wouldn't that be so fun to take the new Grenadier and drive the length of Africa in a brand new vehicle. Yeah. Cause you know, why not <laughs> exactly there? There's keys there to are the a Grenadier key. right here. <laughs> jingle, right. jingle, jingle, jingle. <laughs> Scotty's got the keys. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's so funny. Cause I leave tomorrow morning on, yeah. the, on the flight. Uh, the keys just arrived today. <laughs> in, so now this is the spare set of keys. There, there's obviously a set of keys with, yeah. the, with the car on the boat. Uh, the vehicle arrives in Durban in the yep. next couple days on a Wilhelmsen ship. So it was shipped roll on, roll off because it's still totally stock. It's a totally stock vehicle. So they're able to ship it with all the other new cars that go into South Africa. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And, and it also made the shipment very quick. It was only about three weeks from, from Europe to Durban. Yeah, the vehicle shows up in the next couple of days. I fly out tomorrow. And I guess kind of just to give an overview of what it is that we're doing. And Matt and I are talking about how we're going to get him over there for certain sections of it. But the goal is to drive the long axis of Africa. I've been so fortunate through the years to, you know, have circumnavigated the planet three times and I've I've technically crossed all seven continents, but we've never really focused on the seven continents because I wanted to do the long axis of Africa. And that's what we're about to do is drive the length of Africa. The, <laughs> Which the, is awesome. The thing that's crazy though, is that even as of today, the day before that I leave, we do not know for sure which route we're going to take because there's so much happening in Africa. So there's wow. so many dynamics, particularly in Sudan. Even in the last 24 hours, you have the Wagner group, you have this attempted coup in Russia, in Russia yeah. which is going to most likely significantly neuter the the Wagner group and that's the group that's putting all the pressure in Sudan right now I didn't so know there's that. this little proxy war going on yeah. between the government which is supported by the United States and the Wagner group which supports this private security force oh, okay so it's the African continent is very dynamic which is part of the reason well, why I love it and the thing it. is that it changes all the time it like does. by the time you reach it's like you can start heading north. That's right. And by the time you reach, it's going to be like civil war. What civil war? Oh yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I kind of agree with you, and I think that that's going to be our plan because I really would love to go spend some time in Rwanda, and I, mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to Tanzania. And you've been there. I've never been to Tanzania. I before. mean, like I've been to the Four Seasons in Tanzania. It's not. Like yeah, I'm but still, think serious. Yeah, you saw the beautiful, you know, the scenery and the wildlife and everything else, yeah. and. And I'll fly in for that part. <laughs> okay, done. Let's make yeah. it happen. I really want to climb Kilimanjaro. Yeah. That's the oh, East Coast man. route. That would be really cool. So I'm just really looking forward to doing that. I just, I really love 
Kenya and Southern Kenya and that whole zone. I've always wanted to go to Ethiopia. So there's a couple options. Basically, we're looking at three different options. Cape Town to Cairo is option number one. That's our preferred option. Yeah. The other one would be Cape Town to Djibouti, which gets us into the Sea of Aden. And it's it's just as much of a continental crossing as anything else. And then ship the vehicle out of Djibouti yeah, um, or stage it in that region for a bit until things cool down. It'd be kind of cool if you're going to do Djibouti to hop over to Saudi Arabia. Yes. Um, the problem is I can't take this vehicle into Saudi Arabia because it's right-hand drive. Maybe what we'll do is we'll we'll get some motorcycles in Ethiopia or ship them into Ethiopia. No, no what you do if you're going to, to South or to, to Saudi Arabia is you call Luai. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he's in Riyadh. He's a listener and he'll hook us up. Totally. Um, but I was thinking, cause there's a ferry you can take basically to Jordan yeah. and then you ride the motorcycles through Jordan, Iraq, Northern Iraq and into, yeah, that'd be really nice. And into, into Turkey while the vehicle's being shipped up and you kind of, wrap around and do the whole thing. So there's so many options. And then of course, option C would be run the West coast of Africa, which has its own challenges right now. There's been a lot of um, elections and there's a lot of contested elections. There's things that are happening. So it's, it's pretty sporty. The, the, the key thing here is that there's options. There is options. That's, that's kind of fun. There is. And, and we have the vehicle for up to a year so we can, a lot can change in that amount of time. Yeah. And the goal, though, is just for us to be able to see this beautiful place. And yeah. I've talked about in the podcast a lot in the past that a lot of my trips have been much faster than I wanted them to be. This one won't be as slow as I would like it to be, but it won't be so well, fast. Well, you're also so. going to be able to kind of, at least from what I know, the plan is to kind of break it down into sections. That's right. Fly back. You still have a business to run. You still have a life. You know, there's plenty of places that you can leave the vehicle. I like that concept because I think that for someone, there's more people who could do that than just say, I'm going to take a year off or I'm going right. to do this. Like I'm, I'm going to go over what it doesn't have to be a three month period. You know, you can cover a lot of distance in Africa in a, in a one month period, leave the car for a little bit. Now, obviously you're going to be spending a lot of money on flights. I've banked the, the, the air yeah. miles. So I've got, <laughs> I've got the air miles to spend. And, and I do find personally that I prefer to travel for about six to eight weeks Hmm. and then come back home. I love my family. I miss my friends. I enjoy my team here. I enjoy working with the team in the business. And there's a lot of things that are going on. So I do find that that tempo of travel for six to eight weeks, be in North America for six to eight weeks and then kind of, you know, rinse, wash, repeat kind of thing. So I like it. So the first section, obviously, so tomorrow you leave for I do. Johannesburg. I do. The vehicle gets shipped into the Durban, which is for those who don't know, it's the main port. In, it is in yep. South Africa. You know, I mean, I guess there's uh, getting a vehicle through all this that stuff. will we'll take some time. And it then, does. And it does. Where's, where's the first place that Scotty's going to go? It's so fun, but it's and it's a shocking coincidence, and it is literally just a coincidence. But the entire XO team also, oh, yeah, they're they right. fly tomorrow. Oh, okay. Two. Yeah, because Richard and Ashley are flying. Tomorrow too. That's right. Okay. I didn't realize that. The- <laughs> so it is just this, it is this wonderful, beautiful coincidence that all of these people that I love, I mean, Clay and Rochelle is going to be there, their family, Richard and Ashley. Yeah. The boys you know, are going this yeah, time. It's just going to be awesome. So I'm, I'm excited to, to fly in. I mean, I think even Dr. John Solberg is going to be there. So I'm excited to fly in spend some time with them you know, work on getting some of the equipment set up that we need to get set up. We got to get some vehicle preparation stuff done. Yeah, because you're going to have to outfit the entire vehicle in South Africa, essentially. That's correct. And this is an opportunity for us to also show those that are listening and watching on YouTube, this podcast, we talk a lot about keeping vehicles simple. And that is exactly what we're doing with the Grenadier. We're fortunate that the Grenadier, and I should just preface this before we even really get started talking about the car. Um, Ineos is providing a vehicle just like they would provide a test vehicle for me as as a journalist. So we're not being compensated by Ineos in any way to use their vehicle. There are plenty of other manufacturers that would have provided us a car as well. So um, this is not a sponsorship by them. We are taking the vehicle for a year. We're going to do something really special with it. 
we believe that this platform has a lot of promise. We think that it's going to be very popular with our audience. So we want to show, can it do this kind of work or not? Yeah. Cause um, this is what it's built for. It is there. literally built on purpose is their tagline for things just like this. We we're not being paid by Enios, which means that we can actually speak freely about our experience. We can share our experience with the vehicle. We can also show how we modify it for the trip, which fortunately it actually doesn't take much. I mean, I was going on and I was, you know, building, I have to admit, I'm still on the fence whether I'm going to pull the trigger on mine because I got plenty of cars. It, it, It would mean selling my beloved wagon. It's really fun having a twin turbo V8 in a station wagon. So, you know, I've, I've, I've gone through and I've built a Grenadier so many times and it's, it's really impressive, you know, where historically, oh, I'm going to have to modify the vehicle for a snorkel. I'm going to have to modify the vehicle for a winch capable bumper. Now there are other manufacturers, Jeep that's doing that. I mean, I think on the new AEV stuff with, with uh, Chevy, yep. GMC, yep. And, like there's options out there for that Bronco, that kind of thing. Factory dual battery systems, definitely mm-hmm. not. Fold down tables on the rear door, definitely not. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you would have to spend time, money, and energy doing that That's are correct. just kind of done. They are. And in and it is, I've always liked to describe it as kind of an amalgamation or a modern the modern opportunity to have looked at all of the great things about the 70 series Land Cruiser, all of the great things about the G Wagon all of the great and charming things about a classic Defender. And you kind of put those all together and you end up with that vehicle, but it's in 2023. Yeah. We're looking at a brand new vehicle with all of the modern safety features and then all of the learnings that's happened over that period of time. When the G-Wagon was first designed in the early 70s or late 70s, I suppose, that was a different time. And now that same engineering group had the opportunity to design the equivalent. Yep. Because the G-Wagon's gone a totally different path. It has. I think they're awesome. They are awesome. But realistically, they're like 150 grand these days. That's right. We can now get the professional pack, but it's a twenty-two or twenty-seven thousand dollar option for a roof rack. Yeah, you know, like that's where the 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 Grenadier is really, really appealing. Correct, and the Grenadier is less than half of that price. Originally, my goal was to get a Trial Master, and there was actually one that was allocated. Um, but they're like any new car company, and every car company today, they're struggling with getting components with. With, um, you know, the infrastructure of getting chips, getting computers, getting motors out of BMW, everything else. So it took some time to get the vehicles available. But the cool thing is, is that they had the global media drive. And so they were actually able to pull a car that was low miles and had been through all the entire, all of the processes. And they were actually able to grab that vehicle for me. But that is a field master. So the difference between a field master and a trial master is this dual battery system. And the field master has, well, you can option the battery system on a field mm-hmm. master, but this one that I have doesn't have that, which I'll talk about that in a second, why that's not a concern, but it has this beautiful leather interior, but I'm going to put uh, Melville and Moon seat covers on that. So cool. protect the leather and, and also it's going to be a lot more comfortable in the in the heat of yeah. of Africa. It looks more more fit for purpose for sure. And then it doesn't have the dual battery system, but we've been working with Red Arc, and we're going to install a Red Arc cool. DC DC management system. We're going to put in a small lithium ion battery, and we'll be able to to get the vehicle prepared in South Africa for that. We're also going to go with the drawer system in the back, which is going to give us the opportunity to organize and lock and just up all out of gear. sight, out of mind things. I think you're exactly right, Matt. So that's one of my biggest concerns is I want to be able to park the vehicle and the, and the windows are all clear, no tinted windows, which I love. Yeah. So when people look inside the vehicle, they will not see a bunch of stuff in there. It'll all be under either in the drawer system or under the sleeping platform. And my plan is to sleep inside the truck. For the most part, or maybe sleep on the roof rack, you know, where the conditions, I guess you could do a roof tent. I've considered it. There's some that are actually coming out that are pretty good. Like Alucab, and I didn't know this until recently because I saw it at the Overland Expo, but Alucab now has this, it's like a hundred pound roof tent. Interesting. It's maybe even a little bit underneath that. Yeah. And it's, it's made out of aluminum. It's extremely low profile. You almost can't tell that there's a roof tent on the vehicle. I'm still considering that as a possibility. Yeah. I mean, 
my travels in Africa are not as extensive as yours. And collectively, there's people that have a, a bajillion times more experience. But if, if you took the the cost of a roof tent, like let's say it's going to cost you two grand. Yeah, sure. Maybe in South Africa, they're a little bit cheaper there. Yeah. Made there. That's a lot of, uh, you know, hotel stays. hotels and lodges. Like, yeah. The key thing to remember is that you can't just really pull over and camp everywhere in yep. Africa because there's things that will eat you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, or you don't want at, at a minimum, you don't want monkeys and baboons messing with your tent while you're sleeping and, sure. and all this kind of stuff. A lot of times you're paying for campsites anyways, yep. uh, cause they have to be kind of enclosed Yep. and all of the trips we've done there, which again, not, not super extensive, but it was like $30 for a campsite. These aren't exact figures. And then you could get a hotel generally at the same place for 50. Yep. If if you're doing that and you're on a budget, that does make a difference. And a special thanks to Onyx Off-Road for helping to support this week's podcast. Going further on your adventures is about having the right tools. The Onyx Off-Road app's intuitive maps make it easy to find trails and disperse camping. And their offline maps give you full GPS navigation capability without cell coverage. I'm also really excited about their new route builder for planning and sharing custom trips. It's got a snap to trail tool where you can just drop points where you want to go and a route automatically connects to the closest road or trail. You can build, save, and add routes to folders and share your entire trip with your buddies. You can find out more information on onxmaps.com. You can also find their apps in the Apple Store or whatever other device that you use. Thanks again, Onyx. And I hope to spend a lot of time remote. So I do hope to be camping out in remote areas. We're looking at the possibility of crossing the Kalahari. I mean, we're going to be camping along the beach in Mozambique. Cool. There's going to be a lot, a lot of opportunities to camp, but I don't mind sleeping inside the vehicle. It's something that I, I did for the entire entirety yeah. of Expedition 7, and it worked out so really well. So with the drawer system that's going in the back, the seat folds yep. forward, and then you'll kind of have a little platform. In there. Correct. And that'll give a couple different cubby areas for uh, the heavier items like tools and recovery gear in the yeah. footwells or the rear passenger seats. The one challenge with the Grenadier that I'm I'm very aware of is the the range. So it has a 90 liter fuel tank, so just over 20 gallons, and with the fuel economy of the gasoline motor, because I can't use a diesel in Africa because the diesel requires ultra, ultra low, low sulfur, sulfur, sulfur diesel. diesel. So we have to use a petrol, which it's funny. A lot of people will say, "Oh, you have to use diesel because of availability." That's totally wrong. Uh, whoever scooter. whoever made that uh, whoever made that that up is scooters wrong. Scooters don't run on diesel. That's right. And the world runs on scooters. That's right. Exactly. So I mean, when I crossed the Silk Road and the Jimny, yeah. it was a gas motor. It was just no big deal. They're kind of simpler these days, to be honest. Like yeah. anything that's meant for sale in a you know well developed country, they have emissions regulations, and even and even these second and third world countries now are starting to have emissions regulations for new vehicles because they're not a they're not a significant market. Yeah, uh, in their own standing, to to have something developed for them. So, or the manufacturer just can't develop a, a separate or a yeah, high yeah, sulfur exactly. option. So, the one real upside though of the diesel is is that you get a lot more range out of the same tank. So it's about a thirty percent hit to range. So that's actually kind of interesting. Like I didn't realize that they only had a ninety liter tank. Yeah, because like a troop carrier or a lot of these these vehicles, it's pretty standard to have two ninety liter. That's tanks. correct. That's um, correct. Like 90 liters kind of being that standard tank size in a lot of these vehicles used by NGOs and, and whatever. Correct. Someone's going to come up with an aftermarket solution and it will probably involve rerouting the exhaust in the rear mm-hmm. where that, uh, that tank kind of plugs in where that large mm-hmm. exhaust is. And then yeah. they'll make a smaller muffler or some <laughs> solution around that. But I do have a, I do have a way around it where i i worked with giant loop and giant loop has these oh roll, those bags they're rollable really nice. fuel bags so i have an extra 20 gallons when you need it that's and right when you don't need it it's the the weight of a couple pairs of pants correct and that's the huge difference so those for those that are listening that aren't aware giant loop sells these fuel bladders again they're not a sponsor of the trip we, we we're using these things because they're the right choice they're the only choice really for this application so instead of me having a bunch of fuel tanks 
or fuel cans on the roof, which I don't want for center of gravity. And I also don't want them up there because branches, theft, all the other things to consider. I can keep, I can strap these fuel bladders to the roof rack for short periods of time. But then after you use the fuel, you just roll them up. Yeah. You leave the, you, you leave them out in the sun, you leave the cap open. That's the, right. The, the vapor pretty much all goes away. The yep. smell goes away and you throw them under a seat. That's like correct. That's how we were using them. Like we would use them prior when we still had the gladiator and we prior to putting the long range auxiliary tank in sure. it, sometimes the gas station is just not open and we just carry five gallons and yep. five gallons is if you're in a situation where you have to be concerned with making it to the next stop, 80 to hundred miles easy. That's right. You know, that's right. And it's, it's again, there's scooters everywhere in Africa. So getting petrol yeah. is not a challenge. What it can be a challenge is getting good quality fuel, which this vehicle does require good quality fuel. So we're going to do some pre-filtering. We're going to try to bring as much high quality fuel with us in the vehicle, but it's really nice to have these bags because when they're not used, you roll them up. And if you you are using them, you strap them to the roof rack, and you, you know. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, so it's really it's really a clever solution that I'm really I'm really grateful to, for the fact that we have that as an option. Uh, so that's going to address the fuel range, and then for navigation, we're using Garmin because one of the reasons um, that we use Garmin in Africa is because of Tracks for Africa. So Tracks oh, for Africa integrated. You can buy these micro SD cards that have oh, okay. all the maps on there. That's and then nice. it's something that Garmin will draw from as a base layer. And so we use Garmin devices all the time, but we use them primarily as, as a way to get a very reliable track. One of the issues that we have with the apps on our phones is the track reliability. Mm. It's, it's usually caused by this kind of edge of service problem where the phone thinks that it has cell coverage and it's trying to mm triangulate its position from cell coverage, but it doesn't really have cell coverage. And then you end up with this drop track. So we always use Garmin units to get this reliable track data. But in Africa, Garmin is the best solution because we can run tracks for Africa as a base layer. And that shows all the backcountry routes, yeah, all the okay. campsites, all the things. Yeah. Tracks for Africa is great. Super I mean, good. It's, yeah. It's, you used it in Namibia. And- yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really good. And you know, I, I have to say that I do like personally, I just use my phone because I'm too lazy. It, it's all there. But the problem is, is like, I've had a lot of issues with in you know, whether it be Gaia, Onyx, Google, like they all have some kind of offline option with Gaia. The problem I have is I'll switch phones or I'll switch this or whatever. And then I have to re-download everything. And sometimes those files they do get corrupted, you know, uh, for what reason I I don't know. Or you just forget to download them. Yeah. A lot of times it's probably me saying, oh, this app sucks, but it's probably, you know, user error. You also, you have a little bit of redundancy, which is nice. The redundancy is critical. So I'll have other, I'll use Gaia on my phone and, Mm. but I'm also going to just really rely on the Garmin and then have a backup Garmin device that I can use because tracks for Africa is such a key component. Yeah. To it's worthwhile with. having it on your phone too. Yeah, um, for sure. I actually like it on my iPad because you can kind of go and plan your next day and really know where you're going. Yeah. I just really like maps. Yeah, I know. Like it's so great. So that's what we're going to run uh, for navigation. I've been a long time fan of the ether stuff, ether apparel, Jonah and Palmer that run the company. They're total overlanders. They love yeah. travel adventure motorcyclists. That's how I met him was just riding adventure motorcycles with him. So we're going to be using some of their gear too, which I'm grateful for that. And that means when I come down, we can be matchy matchy. That's right. That's right. I have developed an ether problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, cause it's just super good stuff. I use it for all my motorcycle gear too. So yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a great brand. And we're I really- get all the Scott Brady hammy down. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so the vehicle modifications are going to be very limited. We are, we're considering going with a slightly taller tire, but I'm actually, part of me is like, I'm not going to do it because it is, if you buy a Hilux in Africa, that's that's the size tire that ends up on the truck. Oh, oh, okay. So, and does it have KO2s or something? KO2s on it? already on it, 17 inch wheel. The Hilux that come into the country are on 17s. Here's my only experience with KO2s. I think that they're really, I've had them on a few vehicles. I think they're really great at limit handling. They're a good kind of compromise, uh, kind of for how Americans use their, use their vehicles. They chip 
They so chunk and, chip. and chunk and chip so terribly on gravel. I think the new ones are a little bit better in my did they experience. Change the, they did. the compound. They changed the compound and they improved the lug integrity at the shoulder. The previous generation KOs were they were really bad on chunking. Yeah. Uh, the newer one has a better has better lug integrity. Yeah. So we, I like roasted a set of KO twos in one trip. Now yep. granted that one trip was like across Nevada, and it was maybe I had a heavy foot, but. No, they had a real issue with chunking. Yeah, I, I just wonder, you know, if you're going to change anything. I don't know. Like, I don't want to say that the KO2s won't do it. They yeah. obviously will. Yeah, I think I think that the new version is better. But I am considering the, the possibility of changing to yeah. something that has even more lug integrity yeah. and is also a little bit uh, taller. So a, a 255 80R17. So that's a 33-inch diameter. But is tire. it going to be like an obscure... That's tire the size and that's why i'm because if, it, why if I'm it's on a hilux i mean it's like finding whatever is on the rental hiluxes correct right because that's going to be the tire then. 265 70 r17 and they're everywhere yeah again when we transition from this kind of domestic overlanding in the u.s to international i'm just not really concerned with tire size like yep. that's that's some of the things that people have been saying about the grenadier when when they talk about it to me is Oh, well, yeah, it should have had 35s or it should have had this. I'm like, yeah, but I think you're mi actually missing the point. Totally like missing the don't, point. A 32 inch tire is something that you used to modify a vehicle to fit. Like, correct. You used to, you used to put a two inch lift on your defender so you could put a 32, maybe a 33 on there. XJs came with what, 28 or 29 inch tires and 33s were like a six inch lift or something. You don't really need it. And what are the other downsides of going with bigger tires? That's going to have an even greater impact to my fuel range. Like, so, and then there's tire availability, center of gravity let, changes. Let's also so. be like really, really practical. Getting into parking garages. Sure. You know, like, like keeping a vehicle low. Like when you, when you leave the U.S., there's generally not as much space. Like we have a lot of open parking lots. Like sure. anytime you go to a shopping center that, that I've been to in, in Africa or wherever, there, there, there are structures, you know. Yep. And being able to fit, being able to park at a hotel, being able to park at an airport. Like, I'm not saying that that one inch is going to be the difference by the time. Sometimes it is. But by the time we talk about not putting jerry cans that add a foot on top, that really starts to make a difference. It does. And the closer that we keep our vehicles to stock, the better. And there, fuel range. That's And that's the biggest reason why I'm hesitant about changing the tires. Yeah. Fuel range is the most important reason why I'm hesitant. And then... The next one would be availability of the tires. Yeah. A two sixty five seventy R seventeen is a very ubiquitous tire throughout Africa. Yeah. It's not as common as a seven point five R sixteen, but that's changing because new vehicles don't like come a with split. Rims. Like a, a two hundred series comes on a seventeen in Africa too now, so it's it's just the reality of it. I like kind of how you're setting it up. It's one I think for testing and seeing what the Grenadier can do. As little as you can kind of deviate from stock, I think is cool. You know, and I think it's just cool to not have to spend the energy and effort on it. You know, spend it's, the energy and effort on. I know that you're going to do the lithium battery and that kind of stuff, which I think is really smart. Are you going to do a fridge? No fridge. I don't think. Ooh. I don't think I'm going to do Ooh. a fridge. I just, I just, I know. I can't go back. I know. My, my new thing is this. Or I'll do a really small one. I've considered like getting the smallest Dometic or That's the smallest National Luna. And I'll throw that like for long road trips, I'll throw that in the wagon. Sure. And it's really nice. It doesn't take up much space. It's maybe it's 14 or 16 inches tall. Sure. It's, it's not that big, but you're really just throwing, you know, a sandwich in there and, you know, a six pack of beer and, and it's maybe a more practical look. And I think it pulls like seven, five amps. They're oh, really, they're really low amp draw. Yeah. It, a lot of it's going to depend on how the, like the packaging, the drawer system and stuff works yeah. out. So the modifications are going to be really limited. I'm yeah. going to go with, I'm actually going to use a Melville and Moon uh, bedroll inside. Okay, cool. I think it's just going to be, it's going to be great to apply a lot of the things that we value around overlanding to such a long trip. The big trips that we've done before, these were campaigns. These were like four year long epics and yeah. this is going to be something where i'm going at a different pace i'm really going to focus a lot on the culture i'm going to focus a lot on the experiences to do it in a minimally modified vehicle is kind of fun yeah so 
Yeah, so we're getting so ready. Excited. We're getting ready for for Africa. We thank all of you so much for listening and for learning along the way with us. Matt and I continue to learn on a daily basis. Even planning for this trip, I've learned so much, and it was exciting to get that DHL package with the keys to the vehicle. That's yeah, actually the spare key, there. and uh, all of the paperwork is coming together. You'll be able to follow along the journey on all of the social media accounts. Of course, we'll have articles in Overland Journal, articles on Expedition Portal. So you can go to Expedition Portal on Instagram, Overland Journal on Instagram, or if you want to contact me directly, or if you have any questions, or if you're in Africa yourself and you'd like to meet up, or if you live in a part of Africa that I might be able to say hello to you along the way, it's always great to have friends on the ground. So you can reach me directly at scott.a.brady on Instagram. You can reach out and I'd love to connect with you I've already had a bunch of people reach out that live in Africa that we're going to be able to meet and say hello to along the way, um, which I think will be really fun. So yeah, we're getting ready to cross the continent of Africa. And hopefully, Matt, the next podcast that we do will be you and I somewhere in the Cocoveld somewhere. I hope so. Yeah, (laughs) Awesome. We thank you all for listening and we'll talk to you next time.